Okay, let's get started. Uh, this is Glenn McGovery from ICLR, and uh, I would like to welcome uh, today Keith Thompson from Dalhousie University. Keith is going to talk to us about uh, marine events and uh, coastal flooding, among other things. Before we get into it, I just want to let you know what our plans are for next month. So what we've decided to do is to take our two uh, annual forecast sessions, the one on wildfire and the one on hurricane, and offer them via WebEx only, so there won't be an in uh, office option next month. So please join us on June 6th at 11 a.m. for the wildfire session to talk about the forecast for the upcoming wildfire season in Canada. And then on June 20th, also at 11 o'clock, uh, for the North Atlantic Hurricane uh, Session with uh, Bob Robichaud from Environment Canada, the Canadian Hurricane Center in Halifax. Uh, you should have both uh, received flyers for both of these events. If you haven't, uh, we'll get them to you if, uh, if you require them. And uh, with that, I'm going to uh, pass the floor on over to, uh, to Keith. Welcome. Yeah, well, thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to thank Paul Kovacs. I've known Paul for a number of years now and uh, he invited me here, so I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to give this presentation and hopefully it's going to be useful to you. Extremely long title, but it's covering a lot of ground. I'm going to talk about predicting and projecting mar uh, extreme marine events. And I'm going to look at weather timescales and also more climate timescales as well. So I'm covering two timescales. And hopefully you'll see some similarity in the approaches that I'm going to use. Uh, I'm at Dalhousie University. I'm in the Oceanography Department at Dalhousie. I'm a Canada Research Chair. And Natasha Bernier is a research scientist at Environment Canada. And she, I'm working with her on the um, forecasting of storm surges. So one third of the talk. It's fun to work with Natasha. So this is the overview of the talk. Uh, it sort of explains the rather long title. Um, I want to overview for you a new national network that's been established called Leopard. And I think this is the reason Paul wanted me to come, was to, was to, to give you an update on MEOPAR, in the future it could, be, it could be useful to you. In fact, Paul wrote um, a very helpful letter of support when this MEOPAR proposal was put forward. And maybe we could come back to that at the end when we think about next steps. So an overview of the network, then I'm going to talk about the sort of the weather time scale. I'm going to talk about predicting storm surges. So we're thinking about flooding here. With about 10 days into the future. So here's an example of jars creeping in here, lead times. That just means we want to go 10 days into the future. So as, as, we, as I continue with this talk, if there's anything jargon wise that isn't clear, just stop me. Because that could well happen. Um, and then the last part of the talk, um, I'll be worrying about how do we project flood probabilities, overcoming decades, and uh, up to the end of the, uh, this century taking into account uncertainties, for example, in sea level rise. We know this is an uncertain quantity. What are the implications of that? So that's the, the, that's the menu. Um, I guess I can do it from here, can't I? Okay. So let's, let's talk about the, uh, the network of centers of excellence called MEOPAR. Uh, what does MEOPAR? It's a terrible acronym, but it, but it, it is <laughs> accurate. It's not too, too fancy. It stands for the Marine Environmental Observation, prediction, and response. So I'll just break that down for you and tell you what's really hiding behind this acronym. Marine environmental, we don't see, you don't see ocean there. We're worrying about the atmosphere as well. So MIAPAR is concerned with extreme winds, for example, but also with extreme events in the ocean. So MIAPAR is worried about making relevant observations in the ocean. Um, for example, during, during a marine emergency, or also trying to coordinate the collection of long-term measurements. We're still observation poor in, in my discipline. We also need to, to turn those observations into useful things, into useful products, and we need uh, predictive capabilities, sometimes statistical, but sometimes based on dynamical models. So the OPAR is, is also involved in taking observations and using them to validate, to test, and also drive and initialize models of the environment. So think about predicting winds, predict, uh, coastal sea level, for example, and also the biological properties of the ocean. And it's also interested in how you respond to these predict, uh, predictions. 
So there are a number of social scientists involved in Miopark. It's not just people like me. It's not just physical modelers. It involves social scientists. Every project has a social component to it. The overall goal is to reduce vulnerability to marine hazards and emergencies. That's roughly what I'm this will become a lot clearer. I'm going to run through a bunch of projects to give you a flavor of what Miopar is actually doing. It was established in 2013. It's headquartered at Dalhousie. Uh, it's receiving $25 million over five years from the NCE program. This is a national program run by the Canadian government, NCE, National uh, Networks of Centers of Excellence. Um, but it's getting significant uh, additional money from its partners. There's a possibility, if it's successful in the first five-year phase, of being renewed twice. So there's potentially another 10 years of funding here. So if this works, it'll be around for quite a while. So Presently, it involves 50 researchers from 12 universities across the, the country. It has a number of um, partners, Environment Canada, a Department of Fisheries and Oceans, um, Department of National Defense, and, and their, res their research arm. Lloyd's Register in the UK um, is uh, a supporter here and is funding some work on um, uh, projections of, of wave climate. And as I mentioned, Paul also wrote a very helpful letter uh, when the proposal was submitted. And there are a number of other companies as well. Yes. Is this effort focused primarily on Canada or does it have a global perspective? Yeah. It's, uh, it turns out that, particularly when you go to the longer time scales, you can't think of Canada in isolation. These problems are global. So, so it naturally has a global uh, component to it. Sea level rise is a great example. As we were talking earlier, you can't understand sea level rise in Halifax or Vancouver unless you know something about the West Antarctic ice sheets. So that's all, that, these problems are global with, with local uh, um, issues that result from that. The other thing is that a lot of these activities here are not just happening in Canada, they're not just happening in Dalhousie, they're happening the world over. So there aren't enough researchers to do a good, you know, to, to deal with these problems. So naturally, the, uh, we're working with other groups uh, from, uh, in other countries. And so this is a really part of an international effort to develop these capabilities. So the observations, prediction, and response, all of the researchers have international collaborations as well. So, the focus, the geographical areas, so all the examples I'm going to show, are all in Canadian waters. But so when you talk about the lead time, that's really related to Canada. No, the lead, the lead, here's an example where the jargon can get a bit confusing. The lead time that I was talking about was just, if you want to predict a, um, a marine event, you might want to go one day in the future, five days in the future, ten days in the future. So the lead time is just how far you want to go in the future, and that's jargon that would be used throughout the world. I mean, that people talk about lead times. Okay, so uh, just I'm going to now just quickly run through what Miopar is up to. Um, as I mentioned, there are 12 universities involved in Miopar, so from coast to coast in this case, coming from Memorial right through to, to the University of Victoria. And it has seven major projects underway right now, and this is expanding. So we're presently um, reviewing um, a bunch of uh, proposals that have been submitted. So this list of, of active projects will certainly grow. And what you see here, we've got, we've got uh, a large number of universities, we've got 50 researchers, and they're all contributing to at least one of these seven, seven projects. And what, I'm, what I propose to do right now is just step through very and just give you a flavor, a, a taste of, of what's happening in each of these projects. Is that okay? <clears throat> so the first project, uh, this is the one that I'm involved with, and uh, the work on storm surges um, is actually part of this, this broader project right here. So the idea here, what we're trying to do is develop a relocatable, it can be moved around uh, to different locations, a relocatable atmosphere ocean prediction system. So we're not just interested in predicting the ocean, it's also the atmosphere as well. This project is the project lead is uh, Dr. Hal Ritchie. He's an Environment Canada researcher, but he's also an adjunct at Dalhousie University. So we want to develop 
to develop this model, you can think of it as being like a magnifying glass. If there's a, an emergency happening somewhere, you might there might be a need for forecasts of the state of the ocean and atmosphere, particularly high resolution, uh, uh, tens of days into the future. So we're developing the capability of uh, being able to model a patch of ocean um, with a very uh, and, and spin up this model very quickly in response to an to an emergency. So you can think, for example, an oil spill. For example, if there's an oil spill or there's a, a, something happening around a, an offshore rig, there may be a need for for, for the high resolution model to be focused in and start to give high resolution forecasts of the state of the ocean and also the atmosphere locally. Uh, if you think about that Malaysian airliner, for example, that's a great example of where that you know if they found the, the debris, where's the plane? Right. So there you need to have measurements of you need to know something about the current, so you can sort of backtrack from observations, right, of, um, of, of debris associated with the coming down of the plane back to uh, you know perhaps where the where the plane is itself. But you may think I'm stretching here, but some of you will remember Swiss Air. 111, I don't know if some of you remember that. That Peggy's Cove, that happened right where I live. An airliner came down and uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans very quickly had to spin up an ocean model to try and try and re help with the recovery. Okay. So um, that's just one example here. So we're developing a relocatable model and, um, and I'm, some of the work I'm going to talk about uh, fits within this pilot project. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that this is fine scale. Fine scale, yeah, but yes. So what's your revolutionary degree? Uh, the, it, it, it's flexible, but it's definitely going to be down at the grid spacing of the model. Uh, it's going to be down at scales of below a kilometer, typically below one kilometer. There are global models, predictive models running right now for the ocean. They typically have a have a uh, a grid spacing of about eight kilometers. So we're talking about being able to zoom in, and that's why I said apply a magnifying glass. The point is we can, we want to be able to move that magnifying glass, that relocatable model, rapidly to any any point that for which we need information. So that's that's this project. Uh, related to this, uh, with the Mir part is uh, also uh, under the leadership of Jin Yu Sheng and Susan Allen. Jin Yu's from Dalhousie, Susan Allen's from UBC. Uh, building a network of fixed coast, coastal observing systems, but also forecasting systems. So here, what we're doing right now is um, for Halifax Harbour, we're, we're building um, a high-resolution model for Halifax Harbour that can predict the currents and the sea levels. And this is motivated in part by getting the, the, the large ships in and out of the harbour. There's, there's a real problem with under keel clearance and actually getting the, these large ships under the bridge. Right. So, uh, so for harbour applications, there are flooding applications here. And so what we're doing, and uh, Susan Allen is looking at the Strait of Georgia, and eventually we'll be working with the Port of Vancouver. The idea here is that we're building, building this capability of predicting conditions in places where we know that there's a need. Right. And one reason we're very keen to do this is that we're also going to couple the models with an observing system. And one of the issues that we have um, is maintaining observing systems. So part of the plan here is to be able to develop these predictive models which are giving people things that they need, for example, the pilots and the municipalities and so on, what they need, and they in turn will contribute to the maintenance of the observing system. And in this way, we can actually start to build an observing system that can be maintained for a long, long time across Canada. That's just coupling up of the, uh, the forecast systems with the observing systems, and we think it could be a win-win situation. Not spending too long on this. There's another group uh, um, led by um, Danny Dumont uh, at, from uh, UQA, uh, and he's interested in improving surface drift forecasts. So looking at where th how things move around in the ocean, at the ocean surface. You could think about somebody um, overboard or a person overboard, a search and rescue situation or a spill. And he, he's particularly interested in uh, improving our ability to predict where things go when there's a lot of ice in the water. That, that raises some real challenges. So actually this, uh, this picture here shows a bunch of guys from 
yeah, University of Quebec, uh, who are actually um, out deploying instruments in kayak. So I have oh, so much respect for these people, but this picture also explains why I work on models and not, not, not collecting observations. But this is, a, this is a, a group of oceanographers from UQA who are out, um, I think they're servicing a, a, a buoy of some kind. So it's not a race. It's not a race. <laughs> like the lady? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So this, uh, so this project is to do with increasing our ability to forecast in ice-infested waters. Uh, another sea ice application. This is um, a new researcher uh, from University of Waterloo, Andrea Scott. And she's interested in improving our ability to not only forecast large-scale patterns in sea ice distribution, but also weather. Because when you put sea ice into a model, it actually has an impact on the weather and vice versa. These models are coupled. And so uh, what she wants to do is to improve our ability to forecast ice conditions. So you, you can see here's a large-scale uh, ice distribution from, from, uh, from satellite, but also weather as well. So she's working very hard to, to take information from satellites and refine the analysis of, of that, uh, that particular data stream and put it into a form that, that can go into these predictive models that can improve ice forecasts and also um, weather forecasts as well. Um, there's a large, uh, a large activity um, led by Greg Slater on the West Coast which is looking at climate change and the extreme events in the marine environment. Uh, Greg Flato is uh, a lead scientist, lead scientist at CCCMA, some of you may know, Canadian Centre for Climate Modelling and Analysis. Uh, it's actually an Environment Canada organisation that's based at UVic. Uh, Greg is a, an adjunct scientist at UVic. And this is where a lot of the climate re uh, projection work is going on here. So there's work going on here related to sea level rise, uh, looking at wave climate, extreme winds, and probably a lot of the, the material that might be of interest to this, this audience will, is likely happening in this project. There are social scientists here who are concerned about how you take information from these projection models and make it accessible to coastal communities. That's not real exercise. It's I can generate lots of output from a model, but how do you put it into a form that people can use to, uh, to, 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 to uh, decide on how to respond? So there's a number of social scientists involved in this, this project. They're not just looking at physical properties, they're looking at biogeochemical properties too. Uh, looking at the uh, productivity of the ocean, for example. So it, it's broader than just physical measurements. That's a large project. Uh, we have uh, Katia Fennell, uh, she's at Dalhousie University, and when I was talking about downscaling, using these models to come from large scales to small scales, um, Katia's doing a similar thing, but with biogeochemistry. So some of you will have heard about acidification. People are very concerned about ocean acidification right now. And what about the amount of plant life that's in the ocean? How will this change over the next hundred years? So Katya is involved in the biogeochemistry, and she's, she's concerned about how the biogeochemistry is going to evolve or may change over the next 100 years. So you can see here that <clears throat> it's not just storm surge models. When you start to get into this, you have to worry about many, many elements. So the models become more and more complex, and coupling of these different components, in this case the biogeochemistry, um, becomes challenging but important if you want to get to the things that uh, people care about. So let's work on biogeochemistry. And there's another project here uh, led by uh, David uh, Atkinson um, at UVic. And he's looking how large scale weather patterns um, influence um, marine transport and commercial activity in the, Bo in the Beaufort Sea. And he's particularly interested in, again, how you communicate that information on large-scale changes in weather patterns to local communities, local staff, local communities, but also um, some of the commercial activities in the north. So again, he has, he's interested in um, communicating elements of risk. 
but with a focus on, on the impact of large scale weather patterns on marine transport. All right, so that's given you an idea of what's going on um, in Miopar. Um, we have a number of, uh, here are some of the fresh faced graduate students that are involved in, in Miopar. So a large part of Miopar looking at it is uh, Miopar is particularly concerned with training of highly qualified personnel, training the next generation, and also giving these, 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 these students, these uh, graduate students here, um, an opportunity to cross, uh, cross disciplines, so work with oceanography, uh, oceanographers, work with social scientists as well. So training of highly qualified personnel is important. This is a slide that was given to me by the Miopar people, which gives you the very, very broad brush summary of Miopar, what the outcomes are. So uh, one of the desired outcomes is a, is a better informed society. Informing society of, uh, of, uh, of changes on climate time scales and also shorter, shorter time scales. Miopar is also trying to trying to coordinate, um, uh, for example, uh, the development of observing systems within Canada, um, deserve, uh, development of observing methodologies within Canada. I didn't even touch on that, but, but Miopar is trying to coordinate activities across the country. By doing that, we can do a, probably uh, make better use of our resources. Yes? Uh, a question on the informed society with our current federal government that, you know, has a reputation for squelching their scientists in the federal civil service from publicizing the results. Is there an aspect? I know that some of your researchers are both at government and university adjunct professors. Uh, is this going to uh, have no. an implication in that? Um, there are, I want to remain apolitical. Not allowed to answer that. Well, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll make a couple of points there. One is the present government funded Miopar. Right. Right. So they, they've done the thing. They, they put the money in, and th these are our state stated objectives. Um, so it's understood, and that's going to be. It's under. It's a given. I mean, the researchers that are involved here would not do this if they in any way felt they were being muzzled. Um, you notice that I mentioned there are a couple of government researchers there, but they're all adjuncts. So really, this is an activity that's taking place in the academic, on the academic side, rather than the government side. And right now, there's, there's no attempt at muzzling at all. It hasn't happened. And one of the uh, one of the things that again, maybe I can bring this up right now, is that Miopar, one of its uh, one of its what it plans to do is is um, hold occasionally expert fora. Like a, so in other words, you could have an expert, expert forum. You bring people in from across the country and international experts that could discuss issues that were of particular relevance to Canada. Ocean acidification would be a particularly good one. Um, now, when Paul Kovacs wrote the letter of support from ICLR, I think he saw the, uh, the idea of an expert forum as something that might be beneficial to ICLR, a, a way in which ICLR could work with Miopar. And um, one of the outcomes of the expert forum would be some sort of white paper, what's the issue, what's happening in Canada, what do we need, what do we need to do? And so I, I think here, there is a very interesting next step that we could take when Paul gets back into the loop here, in, in which ICLR could play an important role, that is in, in some sort of expert forum, and then getting that information out. So, uh, did that help? Yeah. And training people. So that gives you a pretty broad brush picture of Miopar. Um, and now I'm going to move into the next part of my, my talk. So I mentioned there was there's this relocatable model that we want to, to develop. So now when you have a model, you have to have what are called boundary conditions around the edge of that model so the rest of the world can impact what's happening on a smaller scale. So uh, storm surges are something that we want to put into this model. So as part of that relocatable project, we have a sub-activity, and I'm very interested in this, and it's to do with predicting storm surges up to 10 days into the future. So here's where the lead time comes in. This was just jargon to say we want to go 10 days into the future. So storm surges are an ever-present danger in, in eastern Canada. You hear about it regularly on the news. 
Um, Hurricane One, for example, was a, was a big one. Uh, come back to that in a second. Here's just a picture that, that, that uh, I, I have got from um, Joan Sullivan. Um, and it shows damages um, to, a, to, a, this is to some property um, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, very close, very close to Ramuski. There was a, a fairly large winter storm that came in in December 2010. A fair amount of damage was caused um, in the St. Lawrence estuary around Gas Bay. I think over 500 homes were seriously damaged because of this particular, this particular storm. And there are many, many other pictures that I could have shown here. So let's just let's just see what we're up to. <clears throat> the first thing to note when you're looking at flooding, um, it's not just caused by it, it, flooding is caused by a combination of tides and surges. So in, in our area, in the east coast of Canada, all the way from the Labrador Shelf right down into the Gulf of Maine, tides are important. And so when you're thinking about flooding, it's the combination of the tides and the surge acting together that actually causes the flooding. So here's an example here of a sea level record that's shown in black. So this is measured by a tide gauge here. And this is going from the 19th of February pretty much to the end of February. So there's, there's about 10 days here of time. And this is in Halifax. This is in 1967. I'll come back to this why I've picked 1967. And the black shows what was observed in Halifax. And the red shows the predicted tide. Now, because the tide is due to the uh, effect of the, the sun and the moon, it can be predicted with a fair amount of, uh, uh, fairly accurately. And so the red shows the tidal prediction. The difference between these two is due to, essentially due to the weather. And this, and this particular example, the difference is called the residual of what's left over, is due to the weather. And this is where the storm surges come in. If you have a large event here, over and above the tide, that's what we call a storm surge, and it's due to the wind and the air pressure. So they together can, can cause changes in sea level. And in this particular case, in 1967, it was about a 70 centimeter storm surge that happened exactly at the tide, and that caused significant flooding in Halifax. So when you start to think about flooding, you have to allow for tide and surge together. So you have this combination of events. And so we have this symbol here, ETA, that just means sea level, is a combination of tide and surge. <clears throat> I'm putting up these equations because what I want to show is that the tides you can think of as being known. The storm surges are the things that are problematic. But the good news is we have these, in oceanographic terms, are very simple equations. It doesn't matter what the details are. We, I can write down these two equations that tell us how storm surges evolve. This is force equals mass times acceleration. If you remember that from high school, that's essentially what this equation is. This equation is simply saying if you have a box, if water comes in across the sides and there's an impact, there's a in, net inflow, the sea level, sea level has to pop up. Those two um, physical principles give rise to storm surge models, and they work remarkably well. So if you go in and look at these equations, U is the current, E2 is the sea level. What drives this is the air pressure and the wind. If you know the air pressure and the wind, if you can forecast that, you'll have a pretty good forecast of the storm surge. We know the physics. The unknown is knowing what the atmosphere is going to do over the next 10 days. It's not the, it's not the physics. And it's not the water depth, and it's not the coastline. So how well can we do? Well, so what we do is take those equations, and we solve them over a domain. So this is the domain of our storm search model. And it goes all the way from the uh, Labrador shelf here, almost up to Maine, right down into the Gulf, right into the Gulf of Maine. And it includes the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So we have this model based on relatively simple physics. Um, it includes the shelf. That's shown by the, the white area. It's a relatively shallow water. This is probably about 200 meters deep. The dark blue here is about 5,000 meters deep. That, we consider that to be deep water. The storm surges are relatively weak in deep water. And they, they get larger as you move into the shallow water. The wind has a bigger effect in shallow water. 
And the surge model uh, is based on a discretization of this space. So we, we put a grid across this domain. And the two grids I'm going to talk about, one of them has a grid spacing of 1 30th of a degree. That's 3 kilometers spacing, approximately. And the other one is 1 12th of a degree. That's three times coarser. Uh, the model is driven by a 10 day forecast winds and air pressure. So from Environment Canada, we get forecasts 10 days into the future of what the wind and the air pressure are going to do. Um, and then we can see how well our forecasts do against observations. And if, I'm going to show you the performance of the model from the 1st of March 2013 right up to the end of March 2014. And this is the time for which we have um, winds from a much improved Environment Canada model. So, so this is the domain and you will see here that I've got two forms of the model. Now, this starts to become important here. I've got deterministic. What I mean by that is, in the old, uh, up until recently, Environment Canada would make a forecast of what the winds are going to do. Right? So, so, we, so as a storm surge modeler, you'd be given one forecast of the wind and the air pressure, which we could use to drive our model. But we all know that as time goes on, the forecasts become less reliable. So that growth in uncertainty of the forecast is critical when you're doing wind forecasts and also storm surge forecasts. And so now there's a move to what's called ensemble forecasting. So at a given time, you recognize that you may not know the initial conditions very well. So when you do a forecast, you want to allow for the uncertainty in the initial conditions and look to see how that uncertainty propagates forward in time. And the way that's done on the atmospheric side is with what's called an ensemble. What it means is you run multiple versions of the model, each one slightly different, and then look to see how quickly the, the signal um, diverges. And so I'm going to show you some results from the surge model where we have uh, ensemble wind forces. Okay. So here's some, here's some output. This shows you how well we can do with the best deterministic model. So we're looking here at sea level at Ramuski, and Ramuski, if I failed to show you, Ramuski is right here. There's a tide gauge, it's right here, it's in the Solent estuary, and, and it has experienced some very large surges, and that image that I showed actually came from very close to here. So we're looking at the last, essentially the last, the last year here, and what you see in black is the sea level signal uh, from the, and this is, in here it's going from the 15th of March 2013 to the end of April 2013. So roughly one and a half months. And the black line that you can see there is the observed residual. So that's basically what was observed at Ramuski after the tide has been removed. The black, the blue, shows forecasts that were made three days in advance. So that's a three-day lead time. So we've taken the three-day forecast and put them end-to-end uh, -end for each day over this 60-day, this, uh, this, this uh, one-and-a-half-month period. So when you look at the blue and the black, you're seeing there a compar you're seeing there, you're getting a visual impression of how well we can forecast storm, storm surges three days into the future. And it's pretty good. And the reason it's good is that we've got good forecasts of the wind and the air pressure. If we have that, we can make pretty good forecasts of what the storm surge is going to do. So you can see many of the, here's, here's an event here, for example. Uh, you see there's an event here with, with two large uh, uh, excursions in sea level at this point, some, sometime around about the 20th of March, shown by black. And the model did a very good job of predicting it. So although we complain about weather forecasts, you know, we think that they're pretty bad, you look at this and you say, well, let's take the wind that comes from Environment Canada, put it into a storm surge model, it's not bad in terms of predicting what the storm surge is going to do. Even at five days, so now this is a warning of five days, you're still doing pretty well. You can see that there's a negative surge here. These negative surges are very important for navigation in shallow water. So 
uh, mariners are just as interested in these lows, these lo negative surges, as they are in the positive surges. Depends on the application. So in this case, you can see that the five-day forecast of this negative event was pretty good. It also did not too bad with this, this double peak event right here. So there's predictability. You, from this picture, you can see there's sort of predictability. Seven days. This is going seven days into the future. It's getting worse, it had, which is fairly surprising. But if you look, for example, at this event, and I know I'm stretching it here. If you look at this, this event, seven days into the future, this negative event, that is sort of there in the forecast, but you can see the timing's off. The timing's off, and that has huge implications when you're looking at what the total water level's going to do, because if that has been shifted by a few hours, when you add back the tide, you may have missed the peak or the trough in the tide, and there will be consequences. So you can see here that there appears to be predictability, but the timing's off a little bit. So this is deterministic forcing, where you just do one shot of the one shot of the future. How well does it do across all the tide gauges? Well, here's a plot that shows the skill of the model. So what we're looking at here, we've, we've got this metric, this measure, which is the difference between the observed residual, so what we observe and what we model. We take the difference, so that's the error. And we calculate the variance. So we get a measure of the spread in the, in the error in the model. We compare it directly against observations. And then to make it have unitless, we divide by the variance of the observations. And as we call that statistic gamma squared. Now, if, if the model has, if you just use the constant here for the prediction, you'd have a gamma squared of one. So if you've got a gamma squared of one, you've got no predictability. You may as well use a constant and you would do as well. If the model is very good, It'll be close to the observations, and so the variance will come down, the error, error will become small, and gamma squared will drop below one. So what we care about is whether this statistic is greater than or less than one. When it dips below uh, one, we think we've got some predictability. When it's above one, you may as well use a constant to predict what's going on. And this is a plot of this statistic. Um, as a function of the lead time, as we go into the future. Each one of these lines is for a particular tide gauge. So let's just look at the red one. This is for Ramuski. So over this one year that I've looked at, over this one year, you can see that if, you, if uh, the models actually can reproduce the observed sea level pretty well with zero lag. So it's just turning the wind into the, uh, into the sea level. But as you go into the future, if you did a 48-hour forecast, you're still doing very well. This gamma squared quantity, it's about 0.2. But of course, as you go into the future, the wind forecasts become less and less accurate, and so the quality of the surge forecast goes down. Now, what's remarkable, remarkable about this particular figure, and red is for a muski, is that it, doesn't, it, it takes up to hour 144, six days, before gamma squared gets to one. There's predictability here six days into the future with the storm surge, which is surprising. Really. It's, it's surprising. The gray lines just show the same results for all the other, there are 22 tie gauges that I'm looking at here. The positions were shown on the map. But these other gauges uh, pretty much cover the whole of the domain. And you can see that the gamma squared, yeah, if you could pick a typical value, maybe four, maybe six days, maybe five days. But there's predictability here five days, five days into the future. And this is an unforgiving statistic because in this, in this particular case, if there's a slight mismatch in the timing of the peak, when you do this difference here, you'll get a large error. So even though the peak may have been predicted very accurately, a small timing error would lead to a large error here and a large value of gamma squared. So this is a conservative estimate of the, predictive, of, of the predictive skill of this model. Mm -hmm. Certainly not two days. We can, go beyond, we can go beyond two days. And the reason it grows is because our ability to predict the uh, wind and the air pressure uh, deteriorates with time. Okay, now, 
This is a, 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 a sort of a complicated slide, so I'm, I don't spend too long on this slide. The, the, the wind forecast, did, the quality deteriorates with time, and for that reason that I've, I mentioned before, uh, there's a move towards what's called ensemble forecasting. So at a given time, uh, a number of atmospheric models can be launched. Each one will produce a slightly different version of the future based on a plausible change in the initial conditions. So you're taking the model, you're saying, I don't quite know what the initial conditions are, let me perturb them a little bit, and then run those models, and then the errors will grow. You've all heard about the butterfly effect and, and so on. The errors will grow based on small changes in the initial conditions, and you'll get a slightly different wind forecast as you go forward in time. They will diverge. We can take those forecasts, and we can use them to drive our surge model. Each ensemble member, each, each uh, forecast wind, uh, can be used to drive the surge model. And then we can look to see, okay, for a given tide gauge, this is Ramuski, we can look to see how well the ensemble is starting to get the, um, uh, it's starting to reproduce the observations. The observed sea levels have got not, um, are withheld from the model. They're not incorporated in the model in any way. And what we're looking at here, it's a very busy slide, I know. Let's look at this panel here in the top left-hand corner. The black is basically that residual time series that we saw before. This is the observed sea level, the black, for Ramuski, that, that double-headed event that we were looking at before. It's for the uh, 19th to the 29th of March, uh, 2013. So this is, a, this is a large event here in the observed uh, sea level record for Ramuski. The black, uh, the red, shows the three-day forecast from the deterministic model. So the forecast was launched here, and then you can, you can see that it's actually doing a pretty good job, as we've seen before, of predicting this, predicting this event. The gray show the forecasts that are coming from the en ensemble model. So you're seeing there growth in uncertainty in the surge forecast that are coming from the growth in the uncertainty of the atmospheric forecasts. And so what you can start to see now is uh, the, the, the ensemble system here is starting to tell us, yeah, it won't tell you exactly what's going to happen at a particular time. This is, this is a five-day forecast. This is a forecast that was launched here, and we're going 10 days into the future look. Five days into the future, can you see the gray lines here? They're clustering around this event. It's it, that's the ensemble telling you we think there might be an event that's going to happen around this period. It doesn't tell you, give you one number like the deterministic model. It's starting to give you probabilities that things are going to happen. So this is the, the value of the ensemble forecasting. It's taking into account the uncertainty in the, in the wind forecasts. So when you have ensemble forecasts, what you end up with is a lot of information, and it becomes a real challenge as to how you present this information. And yeah? I, just, I had a quick question about the, so you're saying that you're adjusting various variables for each of the, like, forecast for the ensemble. Right. What, um, like, what sorts of variables do you find that are, are hard to, to have your observation for? And, and so, you know, and what sort of variants are you that, that comes from the atmospheric side, so that's not happening on the oceanographic side. That's the atmospheric yeah. community is doing that. Yeah, so they they come to us as given, but right. they're essentially changing the initial conditions of the atmospheric model. Right. Okay. Because they because they can't observe the initial conditions, so they're having to to modify the initial condition to because okay. they don't know exactly what the initial conditions are. But it's, that's coming that's given to us. Yeah. Another modeling question. Uh, a few slides back, and showed you don't have to flip back. Okay. Remember the three, five, and seven day forecast? Yes. Yeah. What's the refresh rate? You go for three days, you go three days and read the order. No. Every day you refresh. Every 12 hours. 12 hours. So every 12 hours, think of it as time. You're always projecting ahead and, and catching up. Well, right. uh, uh, his time. Yeah. Every 12 hours you launch a forecast that goes forward 10 days. So think of that as a diagonal line coming out. You go forward another 12 days, and you have another. 10 day for 12 hours. But, but every 12 hours, you do the refresh every 12 hours if you want, but the forecast goes forward 10 days. So in the previous plot, the ones that you're talking about, 
we basically took the forecast of the three days into the future and we, we, we put them top to, uh, head to tail, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. The previous, the last figure, we were just looking at one individual set of forecasts. It was so it was slightly, a slightly different visualization. But the refresh rate is 12 hours. The time step of the model is, is, is and, and, uh, the search model is seconds, right? So, <clears throat> so, so imagine now, so the situation that we have now is, if I run the ensemble system now, and I go five days into the future, I've got an ensemble of, an ensemble of forecasts here. So the question is, how, do, how can I display? So in this case, so here you have just some examples of, uh, of, of displays of the output from the sewage system. So we've zoomed in on part of the domain. We're looking at the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the Scotian Shark. We're looking at the 22nd of March, 2013. That's that double-headed event that we saw before at Ramuski. And we're looking at five-day forecasts. So these forecasts were made on the 18th of March. And what you're looking at here in this top left panel is the probability that the surge, the largest surge over this day, will exceed for, uh, 40 centimeters, 0.4 meters. So this is giving you the probability that the biggest level on the 22nd of March is going to exceed 40, 40, uh, 40 centimeters. So, it is, so there's, it's saying, hey, there's, there's something could happen down here. But the scale now is not centimeters. It should actually go from zero to one. It's probability times 100, right? So here you've got probabilities of about 0.8. So this ensemble, and the ensemble size is actually 21. There are 21 ensemble members. Together, if you look at the spread in the ensemble, it's saying that there's, an, uh, there's 80% of them. 80% of the ensemble is above that value. So it's saying it's pretty high. If you go to a higher threshold, 0.6, obviously the probability has come down, but it's still saying that you know there's a probability of 0.6 according to the model that there's going to be a high level in this region. So this is the new sort of information that's coming from these models. They're not deterministic, they're probabilistic right now. And here we're just focusing on the largest surge that occurred, occurred over the day. The other two panels, I'm not going to discuss this because I'm running out of time. <coughs> These other panels tell us about the spread in, in the timing of the peak as well. When the peak occurs and what's the spread in the peak. So we use the ensemble to get at things like the median and the IQR of the uh, timing of the peak. So that's the way things are going now it, in, in terms of storm surge forecasting. It's ensembles and it's probabilistic. Now, this is going to get me to the last part of my talk. This is looking at five-day forecasts now, not of uh, uh, just storm surges, which is only part of the problem. It's storm surges plus the tide. Because what? No, the, the public doesn't care about storm surges. It cares what the water level is going to be. It doesn't care about the distinction between tide and surge. So in this case, what we're doing here is that we're looking at Ramuski. Again, that, that same tide gauge in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. We're looking at five-day forecasts, and we're looking here now, his time, and this is for the 22nd of March, 2013, hour zero to hour 24. And the black line here shows you what the sea level did, the actual sea level at the Ramuski tide gauge uh, for this particular day. And you can see it reached a peak of about 1.7, and this is the this is the event that caused a significant flooding. Right? There was significant flooding associated with this, this particular high, high sea level here. <clears throat> the red shows you the deterministic forecast that was made five, day, five days earlier. And the gray here shows you the ensemble forecast. So each one would have the tide, predicted tide added back in. So here you have black are the observations for this particular day, red is the forecast, the deterministic forecast made five days earlier, and the grey is the ensemble forecast. There are 21 of 21 of them. So what we've done here is we said, okay, what was the largest value that was observed? Uh, I think it was 1.7 meters. What, what was the largest value that was that was, came from the from the deterministic model? That's the red. It's about 1.6. We're not interested, we can, we're allowing, by focusing on the maximum, we can allow for slight timing errors. 
Now, because the tide is not known perfectly, we've allowed for uncertainty in the tide, and that gives us this histogram here. This is the histogram. Okay? So this is the height here. So that same scale applies to this histogram. This is a histogram that's obtained by taking the maximum from the deterministic model and adding some uncertainty due to the tide. So we've added some uncertainty due to the tide. So you actually end up with, with a little histogram. So this is what would come from the deterministic model if you allow for uncertainty in the tidal predictions. And this is a histogram for the maximum value that's going to be obtained for that day, total water level. This is what we get from the ensemble approach. You can see there's greater spread here in the maxima of each of these uh, ensemble forecasts. There's more spread. And that's because there's uncertainty in the, in the wind forecast as well. And this, I believe, is the sort of information that's going to start to be, be used. It's ensemble forecast, uh, it's probabilistic information. And what this is giving you is the probability um, that the total water level will exceed, and you can specify any level you want. And you can go off and you can read the probability that that level, the total water level, will exceed that critical value sometime during that day. So the important thing here is probabilistic forecasting of total water levels taking into account uncertainty in the wind forecasts. This was obtained by combining tide and surge. So you're making a forecast. For, uh, uh, you've got the tide, which is pretty well known, but not perfectly. You've got the surge, which is forecast, again, not perfectly. And those of you that remember your statistics, so you've got two random quantities here. And we're interested in the sum of those two. You convolve the PDFs. You, the way you combine those uncertainties is by convolving the PDFs of these two things. We know how to do this. If, they, if, they, if these two quantities are and treat them as, as being independent. There's a very straightforward ways of combining the uncertainties, and that's what's happened here. And we've effectively got PDFs here of total water level using two types of forecast system. And that's what I want to use when we look at the next hundred years. Sorry, guys, this is a long talk. Did, did, did we want to take, before I go into this, did anybody, has anybody uh, got a burning question that? Okay, so I'm changing gears now, and I'm going to look at uh, projecting flood probabilities um, over coming decades out, out to a century. And some of the ideas that I've described, this idea of taking, uh, taking the sea level record signal and breaking it up into two parts and then recombining them, the uncertainties, I'm going to use exactly the same idea when I look on the longer time, longer time, time scale. So there is actually a connection between what I'm about to talk about and the, uh, the surge prediction work. <clears throat> now, just before I start here, I'm not talking about predicting a particular event 100 years from now. I'm talking about probabilistic predictions here. Now, why would you want to know this? Well, this is, this is critical you know, for adaptation strategies. I talk to people in Halifax that worry about um, uh, setting policy for where people can build, build you know, planets, working with the planets in Halifax, and they're really concerned about flood probabilities under climate change. It's a real issue for them. Like, what, what, what restrictions do they put on uh, areas where people can, can build and develop the, the waterfront properties? Um, I've already touched on this. The way I'm going to describe it, the problem is conceptually similar to that of predicting total water levels 10 days into the future. And what I'll do is look at some, let's look at some observations, and then it will become a lot clearer as to what's going on. I'll stick with Halifax here. This, uh, the reason is this is one of the long records um, for Atlantic Canada. It's actually the beginning of the good record started in about 1920. And this is only up to 2000, but I'll show you an extension of this record in a second, uh, closer to the present day. And so we have time here. And the red line is showing you how the annual means have changed. 
from year to year. So each year we take that record and we average all those hourly values um, and then plot them. And what you can see is there's no doubt sea levels going up. There's absolutely no doubt. Many, many records around the world would have a, a signal similar to this. So, uh, in this case, it's going up, if you look at this record, it's going up at about two millimeters a year in Halifax, three millimeters a year in Halifax. Two millimeters of that, uh, one millimeter per year, that's cut, is because the land is sinking there. So when you start to look at these uh, typical rates of rise of sea level, you can't ignore the vertical motion of the land. It's the same order as the global sea level rise. The other two millimeters per year is, is due, to, due to sea level rise. It's global. And this comes back to this point. If you want to understand what's happening in Halifax, you have to worry about global sea level rise and what causes it. It's, it's a, this is a local expression of a global problem here. Uh, so that's, what, that's sea level going on. But who cares about annual mean sea level? That doesn't cause any flooding. What causes the flooding are the events. It's those hourly values that, 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 that come over the top of the, uh, of the lap of the, the, the uh, stairs of the town hall, steps of the town hall. So what I'm showing also on the same, on the same scale here, these are the annual maxima. So what, what I've done there is for each year, I've taken the largest value in the record. So that's the, 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 here we have the annual maxima. These are the things that cause the flooding. We don't care about this. We care about the annual maxima. So we've taken this long record and we've, we've, we've decimated it. We're just looking at the biggest values each year. And what you see, a number of things here. You see there's an offset. The offset is due to the tides. So there's quite large tides in Halifax, but you also see variability um, in the annual maxima. That's due to storms, essentially due to storms. And you can also see that there's a trend in the annual maxima. The trend in, so, so the annual maxima are generally getting larger, but they're getting larger because the, the mean sea level is going up. And that, that's been observed globally. Annual maxima are getting larger not because of increasing, uh, increasing storminess so much, but because the mean sea level is going up globally. If you reference each of those annual maxima, maxima about the annual mean, right? So every year I go into 1967, I say, okay, what was the annual mean for 1967? Let me take that away from the annual maxima. So I'm separating out the slow sea level rise from the annual maxima. This is what you get. Now, this is, to me, is a very interesting record. This, this particular time series here. So again, we're going, we're now coming up, I think, to 2007 now. So I've actually extended the record a little bit. So 1920 to 2007. There's no real trend in the record. So the trend that you saw in the annual maxima is due to the trend in the mean sea level. The other thing that you see <clears throat> is that here's Hurricane, some of you remember Hurricane 1, the day before I got on the plane and went to Mexico and left my wife, I didn't realize it was going to be as bad as it was, but um, that was Hurricane 1, and it did cause a lot of, those of you that know Halifax, that caused a lot of damage, Point Pleasant Park, and it did cause flooding. Right? And, and so here is the, here's the, this is essentially this event here, this annual maximum, is due to Hurricane 1. Well, the point I want to make, though, is in February 1967, there was an event of similar magnitude. This guy, uh, and we saw, I actually showed you the residual for that event earlier. I went back and checked in the local newspapers. I thought, wow, that's quite a big event. It was the same size as one, right, relative to the mean. I went back and I checked the newspapers in the library from 1967. Couldn't see it until I got to about the third page. And there was a little note there saying, oh, the, uh, the uh, rotary flooded last night. They were much tougher back then. I mean, people worry more about climate change. Back then, <laughs> it happened and it was on the third page. You know, now it's national news, right? Um, but anyway, so here are, the, here, are the annual, here are the annual maxima. If you do a histogram of these, these annual maxima, this is what you get. You get this huge distribution here. You see sort of a tail off to the to run. This is essentially a dumbbell. This is very close to a dumbbell distribution right here. You can fit a GEV, but essentially a gumball distribution fits this. And good reasons. We know roughly, we have got very good reasons to, uh, uh, we know.
know why why these if you do a histogram of these annual maxima, we know why they have this skewed shape here. So what you can see here, if if I just look at these annual maxima, I can see that yeah, a, a, we have ex exceeded 1.9 meters, but it doesn't happen very often. If you look at the an annual maximum of about 1.4, looking at areas, that probably happens about 25% of the time. So I can look at this histogram, or I could fit a dumbbell distribution, and I can calculate the probability that that uh, annual maximum is going to exceed any given critical, critical value. When I know the probability, I can calculate the return period. I can just take the reciprocal of the probability. So I get a probability of, let's say, 0.1, that a certain level is going to be um, exceeded. I can take the reciprocal of that and say, well, that's going to happen every 10 years, you know, assuming this is, this is stationary. So what I'm going to do is take this information and plot it in a slightly different way. I'm going to fit a dumbbell distribution to it. I'm going to get probabilities, and I'm going to turn them into return periods. It's just, but it's just the reciprocal of the, 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 the probabilities. The significance of a gumball distribution, I'm not familiar with that term. A gumball, um, you know, uh, like the central limit theorem. You know, if you add a whole bunch of things, uh, the, uh, the quantities together that come from the same distribution, you get a normal distribution, right? Yeah. And the bell-shaped curve. There's a theory for extremes which is very similar to that, but it applies to extremes. And what it means is that if you start to take blocks of data and you find the maximum value over a, a large block, and then you ask, what's the distribution of the maximum value over that block? It can only take, if, if it converges to a particular form, it can only converge to one of three forms. So it's very much like the central limit theorem. So the Gumbel distribution is, is one, one particular type of shape that those, uh, those, those block maxima are going to, they're going to approach. And you know, so this is, a, this is a special case of the generalized extreme value distribution. But there's good theoretical reasons for believing that the maxima would have, have a, a particular shape. So that's the extreme value theory. And so this is a plot of the annual maximum for Halifax. And what you have here is return level. And I've got return period here, but this is essentially one over probability of it happening. It's coming, coming from the data, right? And this axis here is chosen to, if the data did have a gumball distribution, they fall very close to a straight line. So this is just another way of looking at the histogram. So, but now we have return level here, and we have return period, which is related to the probability of that level being exceeded. And so this is, this is a very common way of dis displaying um, the annual maxima. And so, for example, I can look here and I can say 1.6 meters. I can read across and I would say, this is the fitted line here. 1.6, I expect that to happen every 20 years and so on. So, so if you were to believe sea level would go up, 30 centimeters, you might be, over the next century, you might be tempted just to raise this level up. So if I said to you, sea level is going to go up 30 centimeters over the next century, which is, that's what would happen if it continued at the present rate, go up about 30 centimeters, you might just be tempted to take this distribution and lift it up. Some people, people you often see people doing that. They would just take the rate and they'd say, 100 years from now, levels levels going to be three. So let me just take this gumball curve and assume that we've just lifted it up. And I want to show you that's a very dangerous thing to do. The reason that, that you shouldn't just lift that curve up is that sea level rise of the next century is highly uncertain. We just don't know what's going to happen. And it's not just that the models are bad. It's that we don't know how much CO2, CO2 is going to get pumped in, and that's a, partly a political decision as to what, uh, what emission uh, rates are allowed and, uh, and, and, and what the human race decides, decides to do. So, so, sure, when you start to project sea level increase over the next century, our models are not great. But there are also other unknowns in there, like what is the human race going to do about, uh, about climate change and how much CO2 is it going to pump in through the into the, um, into the atmosphere. And, and this relates to the, what we were talking about before the talk here. This is, a, this is a, it gives you an idea of, of what some of the best minds are saying about what's going to happen to sea level over the next century. So this is a, this is a figure that I've taken directly from the, the recent IPCC. Yep. Yeah? 
sorry, you said to clarify the, the whole lifting of that, that distribution to match historical increases in sea level rise. That's, that's just sort of the same thing as like extrapolating historical trends. Yeah, it's. I'm going to get to that in a second. So yeah, what I've done is I've said, okay, um, that gumball curve that I, the plot that I showed you, it was about the annual mean. So do you remember I'd actually taken out the annual mean? So you might be tempted to say, well, sea level is going to go up 30 centimeters over the next century. So let, let me look at 2100 now. What do we expect in 2100? Then the simplest thing to do would be to say, the mean will have gone up 30 centimeters. So I'll just take that 30. I'll just take my gumball curve and I'll slide up the annual maxima, essentially 30 centimeters. I'll assume that's what's happening now about the annual mean. It's going to look like that 100 years from now, but it's just going to be lifted up 30 centimeters. Right. And now what I'm saying is, well, that's all well and good, but we don't know it's going to go up 30 centimeters. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. And so this figure is coming from the uh, IPCC. This is the, potentially the latest um, report. And this is coming from the uh, summary for policymakers, so it's straight out, straight out of the report. And they would give you uh, medium confidence in this figure. So any, any of you that have read IPCC, uh, it's hard going. And uh, it's full of likely, medium confidence, high confidence, low confidence. So this is medium confidence. They have medium confidence in this. And this was published in 2013. So if you look at the axis here, year 2000 to 2100. So we're going over the next, next century. And what you see here, uh, we actually see two, two sets of curves here. The, look at the blue one. This is what they predict is going to happen given a very optimistic um, uh, uh, emission scenario. So not much CO2 essentially being pumped into the atmosphere. So for this one, it's, it's RTP 2.0, rep representative concentration pathway. But it's just an assumption made about um, how much uh, greenhouse gases is moved into the, into the atmosphere. So that would, predict, that would say, yeah, we should go up 40, cent 40 centimeters, right? That's what we think is going to happen. But we're not too sure, so they put a bit of a spread on it. And that's shown by this little uh, box here. So a fairly optimistic uh, uh, emission scenario would say over the next century, it's going to go up 40, cent 40 centimeters. These other, than that, these other ones, these other three here, correspond to, more, correspond to more pessimistic emission scenarios. And so um, in this one, and RCP, whatever it is, uh, 8.5, but the, uh, the maximum uh, concentration in the atmosphere hasn't peaked by 2100. And that would tell you that, yeah, well, under that scenario, it's up, up to, up to, up to point, roughly about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 meters. Again, with a fair amount of spread. So here you have four views of the future. It's a little bit like that ensemble <coughs> stuff I was talking about with the weather. There are four views of the future here. Um, and they depend on the emission, emission scenarios. And so we, we don't have certainty. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. Here we have uh, four, views of the, four views of the future here. Um, now, what's interesting um, is that over the, you may, some of you, might, and you've mentioned this to me earlier, over the last few days, you, you may have seen something on the news about um, IPCC got it wrong, you know, it's going to be much worse. Well, what's happened is that when the IPCC did this, and it's only 2013, they weren't quite sure how to deal with the fact that the West Antarctic ice sheet may melt, right? And so they, they, they know that they, that they suspected that they've probably been pretty conservative in terms of projecting the sea level rise here they, they, uh, when it comes to the West Antarctic ice sheet. Anyway, there's a new report that's just come out where they've looked at this problem in more detail and they said, well, based on what we've seen in the data, we, just, we, we think it's more likely that these, these values here should be closer to one meter because of the West Antarctic ice sheet than where they are right now. So that's just over a, few, over a year or so. These projections about the rate of rise of sea level are changing. So expect these to change with time as we, as we start to refine our knowledge about how the system works. These are going to change. The character won't change. There's going to be great uncertainty. But as we learn more about the system and we delve more into the, into the models, these, are the, these projections are going to unchange. They're going to change. 
The important point from this figure is that when you start projecting sea level rise, it's a highly uncertain business. We don't know what's going to happen, partly because the models are not perfect, but partly because we don't know what's going to happen to the greenhouse gas. So let me just show you this one mathematical thing here. Um, what I'm doing now look, is I'm writing the annual maximum. Think of this as being the annual maximum for year 2100. So I'm, I'm taking this tide surge decomposition approach again, right? And I'm writing it here as a contribution from the annual mean plus a deviation about the annual mean. So this is the weather is coming in here, and this is where the sea level rise is coming in, in here. So I've done that same sort of decomposition, right? Now, what I've done is I've said, well, let me write down probability distributions for these two terms here. So let me look at the sea level rise term. What I'm doing is I'm saying I'm going to write that as contributions from different scenarios. So I've got scenario one, scenario two. So I'm going to say that this, can, this, this is going to take on um, values that reflect the uncertainty in the sea level rise. I'll show you a picture of this in a second. So I've written it down. I have different weights depending on, on which scenario, scenario I believe the most. And I'm going to have them concentrated, the distributions concentrated around values that I'm going to pick from my PCC. This part, the deviation about the mean due to the weather and the storm surges, I'm going to write as the Gumbel distribution. So you can see what I've done. I've broken up into two parts, sea level rise part and a part in a sense due to weather. What are the consequences of doing that? So I've got two sources of uncertainty. So this is probably the most important picture here. Here's the time coming along here from roughly the uh, beginning of this, 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 this uh, millennium, this century, to 2100. And this is idealized data. So I've assumed that there, I'm going to assume that there, just keep it simple, that there are two sea level rise scenarios, S1 and S2. The, the first sea level rise scenario is business as usual. Sea level's going up at 30 centimeters a century. That's, that's pretty benign. That's pretty much what's been happening over the last uh, 20, 30 years globally. And I'm going to say the probability that that's going to happen is, I'm 80% sure that's going to happen, right? But there's a 20% chance it's going to go up a meter per year, right? So there's a 20% chance something bad's going to happen. And so what I've done here is, is I've used those two PDFs. And so what I've, what I've done is I've combined them to get the PDF. This is, my, this is what I think the PDF of total sea level is going to be in 2100. Let's see what's going on here. The black line here, this green line, shows sea level going up at 30, uh, 30 centimeters per year. And can you see that there are a whole bunch of dots around that? That's reflecting the variability from year to year due to the Gumbel distribution. Right? So as you go forward, uh, sea level goes up, and I've, I've got deviations in the, uh, in the value about, about this mean sea level shown by the green line. The red line shows a realization of the annual maxima under the bad scenario. So what you see with the, with the red circles here and the red line, the red line shows you sea level going up at one meter, one, one meter per century. And then you've got the deviations due to the annual maxima. So you've got these two views of how the world, world could evolve. And so I've combined this information, and this is what the PDF of the annual maximum looks like when you take into account the uncertainty due to the annual maxima and the uncertainty due to the sea level rise. And you can see this actually with some of the two Gumbel distributions. So this unlikely scenario here, which has only got a probability of 0.2, you can see it's extending the tail here. It's extending the tail. Of the, so this is the probability distribution for the annual maximum from 2100. If we choose to put this, show this as a, a Gumbel plot, this is no, I'm, not, I'm just using a Gumbel plot because it's very convenient to show it this way. There are different ways of showing this information. But this, for this idealized situation, this is return period. Here's return, uh, return level for this idealized example. This corresponds to no sea level rise for the parameters I've chosen. This would correspond to the uh, Gumbel plot for 2100 if I just have the low sea level rise scenario. This is for the high sea level rise scenario. This is where you have a combination of the two. And what you can see is there's a kink in this curve. The Gumbel distribution doesn't work anymore. But what it does show you is that in terms of the probabilities, 
when you go to the high levels, they're essentially controlled. The return, return periods for the, uh, the long return periods are essentially controlled by the uncertain, um, uh, the, the, high, the, the high but implausible scenarios. So the implausible high scenarios are determining the curve up here. Down here, for the low return period, low return level, it's essentially being determined by the low rate of rise, which is more probable. But when you go to the, the events that you really care about, what this figure is telling you, you have to worry about the implausible but high rate, high rate of rise scenarios. Because so if you're up, up here, at the 50, 100 year, 200 year return level, you really have to be up there. Uh, you have to worry about the um, implausible events. Let me try and make this a little bit more real, and then I'll finish. Um, this, is, this is a figure for Halifax. This is actually Halifax. This is that Dumble plot. Um, return, return period, return level. <coughs> this is the present day. If you went to the present day and you read off 1.9 meters, using the, uh, the Dumble plot or the observed annual maximum over the last century, you'd say 1.9 had a return period of 300 years. So this red line was fitted to the annual maxima, and by 1.9 meters, I'd read off 300 years. This has never been this has never been observed in the record, but if I extrapolate that gumball uh, using that gumball plot, this is what a 1.9 level uh, sea level, what 1.9 meter sea level would do to downtown Halifax and cause significant damage to the downtown. Those of you who know Halifax will see a lot of your favourite restaurants being washed away here on this figure, and this has got a return period of uh, 300, uh, 300 years. What about in 2100? If, if I use those two scenarios that I mentioned, and I, I know that they're, uh, they're idealized, 80% chance it's going to go up at, to 0.3, and um, a 20% chance it's going to go up at 1. This is what the return period curve looks like. So the 1.9 meter is going to happen every four years if you, if you work, from the, work from this figure. Um, so again, it's making the point that the probability of exceeding high flood levels and, um, in an, under an uncertain, in an uncertain climate is determined, in this case, by the more extreme, by the less likely scenarios. And it's, it's here that I'm not sure if I've made the connection, but there's a strong similarity between the, uh, the statistics underlying this and what we were doing with the storm surges. And it's the unlikely scenarios, in this case, that are driving the, uh, the high flood levels or the, high, the long return periods. That's what we have to worry about if you're interested in the high levels. It's not the meat and potatoes 30 centimeters per year. It's those unlikely um, but large events. So I've finished now. Uh, so there's a trend right now towards probabilistic predictions and projections of sea level based on ensembles. We saw that the storm surges and also expert knowledge. So the IPCC report is based primarily its expert knowledge. And this will change, and so will the ensembles. This expert knowledge will change with time as we better understand the system. And I don't think it, this, is, this conclusion maybe is too relevant to this audience, but uncertainty is not a sign of bad, uh, bad models or bad science. It's a reflection of reality. I mean, the system that we're looking at is, is highly um, dependent on initial conditions. And that's just the nature of the, the, nature of the system. Um, and and, and uh, so some people think, well, you don't know what's going to happen, so the models are wrong. That's not the case. It's just, re it's just reflecting on the um, nature of the, the system we're modeling. And also in, uh, for the climate change stuff, what we assume about the greenhouse gas uh, scenario. Uh, storm surge uh, predictions are improving, and we know that it's the wind, so there are, no, there are known unknowns there. We know we have to get the winds better. If we can do that, and the air pressures, if we can do that, the storm surge predictions will improve. Um, and I would expect rapid improvements over the next, next, next five years. There's just some things happening within Environment Canada, uh, which make me think that that's that, that there's some real advances there. The climate projection business is, is much more complex. You know, Rumsfeld, unknown unknowns. You already saw, you know, over the last year, how our, our um, measures of uncertainty of sea level rise have changed a lot. 
in this case because of the West Antarctic ice sheet. The models are still not complete, to, to my mind. I mean, we still have to couple in the biogeochemistry. And so who knows what's going to happen? So there, there are probably a whole bunch of unknowns that we have to that we have to worry about. And that and actually the uncertainty, better understanding of the system may lead to greater uncertainty. Um, and of course, the other point, and probably the reason I came, is that this is an example of a small part of the work that's been conducted by, by the MIAPAR Research Net Network. And if any of you wanted more information on MIAPAR, it's just www.miapar.ca. So all of the projects are described much more clearly there, and hopefully, um, you, if, if I've missed something, you can, you can get the information from the MIAPAR website. So sorry, guys, that was a long, long talk, but uh, yeah. Well, this is you know, pretty interesting in, in seeing the theory behind it and where the models are going. But from a practical perspective, I mean, there's people in like New York City, for example, and New Orleans yeah. that are looking at, at, at making decisions on, you know, do we rebuild now or don't we? Mm -hmm. And so what's available to them right now that they can use to make that decision as intelligently as possible? Well, I think they have, um, they, they have, they have, uh, much of the same information. The, the methodology that I just described with the convolving of the PDFs and emphasizing the uncertainty, that's research that, that I'm doing right now. I, I haven't published that. I suspect that they're intuitively aware of that right now. Um, I, I suspect um, how they actually decide if, they, if you're going to, for example, put in a, a flood barrier, for example, how the engineers actually decide how high to make that, what level of risk is acceptable. I don't know how they do that right now, to tell you the truth. I, I do know, um, I was at a storm surge meeting um, in Jürgen Hamburg a couple of years ago, organized by uh, uh, Von Storch, and there was somebody there from the UK who was talking about the Thames barrier, you know, whether worrying about what to do with the Thames barrier and whether it made sense to, to increase it, but to uh, raise it. But the factor there that was starting to come in was the cost of doing it. And I think we're at the point now where it's just too costly. So that the factor that's determining the action is not so much the, the probability, it's like the cost of the cost of doing it, right? It was just, so I think in, in the, uh, the what I heard was they're thinking seriously about just if it happens, they're gonna have to pay the consequences. You know, that's uh, a pay for it. So um, but but your question, how the engineers would, would deal with this uncertainty, I'm not sure, to tell you the truth. I'm not sure how they, how they do that. No, we don't, don't really think they are. <laughs> I suspect they're not. I mean, it's, I, I, uh, I had a very interesting, I, I, I had a meeting with the munici uh, municipal planner in Halifax, and there were a number of planners there from around the province. And I gave a talk, it wasn't as long as this one, and it was less technical. But I was talking about uncertainty in sea level rise and and the, and the consequences uh, on flooding probabilities. And this planner put his hand up and he said, "You're telling me that anything could happen. I want a number," is what he said. He said I said, "I'm not telling you anything can happen. I'm, I'm giving you probabilities on what could happen." And and I think it's very uncomfortable for people to have to deal with that because these numbers. They're not a function of the system. They will change because they depend with the climate stuff. They depend on our knowledge of the system, which is changing. So the, the, the target, you know, what, the probabilities change as, as we start to learn more about the system. How much does, does that help? Yeah, it does. And there's a few things that, that are not bothered by what you're doing. I think you've got a, a group of people here who, who support the science. Yeah. And uh, but there are still naysayers out there, right? And, and but this has good consensus in the scientific community, right? I oh, agree with that. Yeah, yeah. The um, the thing that may be controversial here is how uh, most people wouldn't have any trouble with what I said. If, if you know the, the way I'm convolving PDFs and I show them as return period plots with kinks in them, people may argue about that. I'm not going to argue about these uh, these uncertainties in the sea level rise projections. And they'll be very concerned about how you how you build that into the planning. I mean, there are people, there are approaches out there right now. Um, 
a fellow called John Hunter, who's, um, who's proposed a way of allowing, uh, introducing what are called allowances, like sea level increases that will keep the, 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 the frequency of flood events the same. So there are people out there right now that are worrying about this. Uh, the point I was trying to make here is that what you really have to be concerned about that they're not black swans, but they're the, they're the nasty things that could happen with low probability, but, but could have a major impact. They, they really do mess around with the, with the probabilities. You can't you can't ignore them at your peril. I guess is what I'm saying. It probably comes comes to uh, when you come right down to it. There's so much uncertainty there that how, how, however you decide to respond to this, it should be done in an adaptive sort of way, probably. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, you showed us a lot of math here, and I have to admit. Not too much. I, I just, well, I know. I mean, it was for you. It was, I'm going to admit, a little challenging for me and, 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 uh, in, in terms of the average in society. I think I'm yeah. better mathematically talented yeah. than most. But uh, I'm thinking of a discussion I had with someone about six months ago, and, and, and it bothered me, and, and he said, you know, this, 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 sea ice melting, it's all a bunch of malarkey and all that stuff and sea level rise. Uh, I just saw this report and they said, yeah, there's the ice is melting in the North Pole, but it's actually growing in the South Pole, right? So it balances. So this is all garbage. And I was stunned at that. And I went back and I did some research and I found the study online that right. I was referring to. Yeah. And it was done over a one month period in June. Yeah. Oh, well, in June, you would expect the North Pole to be melting and the South Pole to be growing. Yeah. Right, but that wasn't. That's that's not the kind of science that you can deny climate change with. You have to. Some things are undeniable. I, I think uh, sea level is going up. It is going up. It has been going up all of my life. It's been going up, uh, and so, we've known about this for a long. But time. the challenge is we've got to take that message and and reach people that don't understand the math. Well, yeah. Right? When it comes to climate climate change deniers. I mean, that's, uh, I don't want to, again, it's a little bit like the political muzzling debate. I don't want to get to go too far into that. But I would make, would make one point, and that is that if, 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 you, if you look to the more conservative side, you know, perhaps the group that, that, that do uh, deny climate change, I would ask them to, have to, to say, well, who, what conservative group do you tend to believe the most? You know, the most clean cut, let's go out and fix it group. That's the U.S. military, right? The U.S. military, that's a bunch of people there that are very sensible, um, generally conservative, clean-cut people. They've identified climate change as one of the major threats, right, over the next next century, right? So they recognize this. And um, so, you know, people can go in and they can quibble about the details. And uh, But... The other method, but I think a lot of people who've actually looked at the data, certainly the IPCC people, have been very, very cautious about, about the message that they're getting out. But I think people who've looked at the data believe that there are things, there are things happening. The other thing is, you know, this sort of chicken, chicken little business, you know, the sky's falling, the sky's falling. What this bit of math is showing here, and, and what just, just common sense, is that it's not that the, the sky will fall or it won't. It's likely. Is the, is, is, the, is the sky likely to fall, right? So when you start to have these probabilities of very bad things happening, you can't say with certainty. That's the problem with this game. You cannot say with certainty what's going to happen. And that problem is there with storm surges with timescales of 10 days. It's just the nature of the, the business. Um, you, 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 when you start to deal with uncertainty, the public's not good at dealing with uncertainty. If you're saying that there's a 10% chance something really catastrophic is going to happen, um, with the climate, then I would say you should do something about it. If you, if, as, a, as a father, if I was going to let my child go to school and I, I was told that there was a 10% or 20% or 1 in 100% chance they were going to get run over, I wouldn't let them go to school. You would take action. So the public is quite happy to deal with those sort of probabilities and, uh, when it's in their everyday life. But, but somehow when they look at climate and you start to see that there could be these catastrophic events, they seem to have a lot of difficulty in in, 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 in taking that concern and acting upon it. So, um, sorry, a bit of a tirade, but... Uh, uh, you were saying basically with some of the uh, earlier issues, when, when you, much earlier, when you were talking about differences in hours of um, finding a storm surge. I mean... Yeah, it's good, yeah. Uh, 
I think in some cases your, the practical application depends upon the discipline that you're dealing with. With engineers, again, you're looking at you know, what's going to happen in 100 years. With a disaster and emergency manager, if you could go to them and say, well, I can tell you that uh, you're going to have a major storm surge within five hours. Now, it could be off two hours this way, it could be yeah. off two hours that way. He's going to be turning handsprings. Yeah. He can do an evacuation and get people out of the way. So I think some of your, your applications are... It really does depend on who you're talking to and who you're on. Absolutely, audience. that's a really good point. Uh, when I split it into tide and, tide and surge, that's, that was purely for the, purely for the calculations. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the application, it's the total water level. So what's going to happen with this storm surge forecast system? You're right. This will be run, hope, well, will be run operationally by Environment Canada. So they will run it. They will produce the, these products that I showed you won't be going to the public. They will be going to the people in the weather offices that, that are responsible for issuing the warning. So this will just be another bit of information that goes to the to the person that has to issue the warning. And the trick is to put it in a form that they can understand. So what happens right now is they have storm surge forecasts that are coming in, but they don't rely uh, totally on that when it comes to issuing a uh, warning. They look at the weather maps. They go back and look at the weather maps, and they say, well, we know when that storm comes in, the wind blows in a certain direction and sea level goes up. So they combine all that information, and then they issue it to the public. So there's an intermediary there, that the, the, the emergency, the people that issue the warnings. And so a lot of the stuff that I showed there early on with the timing business that would be going to the experienced person who would then use that information and then decide if they were going to issue the warning. So it would just be information that was going into that uh, warning. But a lot of that would be very useful for risk assessment as well, uh, especially to prevent what I call uh, stupid maneuvers, like uh, putting, you know, basically a, uh, a computer center or recovery center right along the water uh, oh, yeah. waterfront or something along those lines. You can at least use something like this, this to say, it's probably not a good idea yeah. because. Yeah. So, you know, having this information out there is, uh, is actually very useful. So a lot of the risk assessments outside of the insurance industry are less than optimal, put it that way. So this is great, um, but I want to say outside. something about the extreme. You were measure, you're, you're showing the impact of sea level rise. Right. On, on, on potential flood heights or certain right. into yeah. the future. And you've used the gumbo distribution that you've parameterized based on the last 100 years of data. So actually, to the extent that the next 100 years show more volatility and more storminess, the picture looks worse, I would imagine. Yeah, right? yeah. Actually, that's a really good point. So it's not difficult to include uh, storminess in the, right. the methodologies, exactly what you're talking about. In fact, I tried that for Halifax. I, I did an analysis yeah. for Halifax. And if you actually look at the projections of uh, wind strength, if you want, yeah. there's, it, 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 it's, it's not there. Uh, so it's not going to have a major effect. I don't think, based on the projections I've seen, in principle you can include it into the methodology. It's, it's, not, it's not difficult to do that. It's just, you know, you could end up, instead of just having high sea level rise, low sea level rise scenarios, you could think of it as being a table with changes in storm and there's no changes right. in storm. So you could, you, you could include it. No, also, if you were, you assume independence between the tide and the surge, and if you were right. to have correlation in there, you would increase the volatility or the variability of uh, volatility good. more. Excellent point, yeah. Uh, at, the moment, at the moment, now we uh, model the tide and the surge separately, but those equations, I apologize for showing the equations, uh, they are nonlinear, and so the tide and the surge actually interact. You can't really treat them separately. There are places around Prince Edward Island where the tide and the surge interact. And so the next step, and that relates to these rapid improvements, will be putting the tide and the surge together in the model, having a more complete model that will allow for the tide and the surge to interact. They're not independent. You're absolutely right. And I'm assuming that at your website you have similar work for other areas beyond Halifax. Um, the, the, the climate stuff, it's a paper I'm just about to, to publish. I can, I can certainly, yeah, that, that will be publicly available. Absolutely. I just wanted to show the methodology, really, and the main point I wanted to make was that you really have to worry about these large but unlikely events. At least when you do the do the math here, they, 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 they you can't ignore them because they they've got a probability of 0.1, right? And it's a paper. Yeah. Hi. Um, do you know of a timeline of when this could be operational in terms of flood forecasting and? Oh yeah. Um, it's already 
Um, it's all, the deterministic model is already you, it's already running in what's called experimental mode. It has been for a number of years by Environment Canada. Um, it was actually developed by a student of mine way, way back. And uh, so it's already it, it's used to uh, by the forecasters to, to decide if they're going to issue a flood warning, as I mentioned before. The ensemble stuff that I described, the uh, work with Natasha Bernier, um, that's underway right now. So that, that's the first evaluation that you've seen. They're the first results from that ensemble system. You're, you're seeing it first. So I would think that's probably going to be several years before that. Um, it's, it's starting to be used operationally. You have to do a lot of testing. You notice there's only one year of data. We only had one year of data because the wind forecasts from the new system were only available for the last year. So it would be nice to have a little bit more than just one year of data. But it will eventually, I would say several years before it comes online. Um, another point I should make is that, um, that many of the messages that I've, the points that I've been making here would apply equally well to extreme winds as well. It's not just it's not just flooding. It's, it's, it can apply to other other variables as well. Oh, there is no more questions. Glenn took off, so I guess it's the MVP yeah. position to me. Uh, <laughs> very much for your talk. I think uh, for me anyway, it really clarified a lot of uh, common issues and issues. Thanks again for coming. No pleasure. My pleasure.